Welcome to the fourth edition of the Kosher Australia webinar series, our special pre-Pesach uh, edition. Uh, broadcasting to you live from the Kosher Australia offices where it all happens in the North Caulfield section of Victoria, Australia. This week for our pre-Pesach edition, we have a very hush of a special guest. Before we get to our guest, I'd like to remind our viewers that the Kosher Australia food guide is ready and available, as well as our Pesach booklet with a lot of very important information on kosher Pesach products, some medicine information there, as well as other Pesach relevant uh, topics in the guide. I'd also like to let everyone know that our new website is up and functioning thanks to our dedicated staff member, Mr. Akiva Melman, Kivi Melman, who again is responsible for organizing these webinars as well. Very dedicated worker Kivi is, and uh, we thank him for all his efforts. Um, so today, Baruch Hashem, we all know Pesach is coming very soon, and we've had the schus to have our Rav HaMachshir, Rabbi Mordechai Gutnik Shlita, joining us for this edition of the webinar series. Rabbi Gutnik has been in the rabbinate for over 40 years, close to half a century, over 40 years. Um, he's currently the senior rabbi at the Elwood Shul here in Melbourne. He's also the senior dayan, the Abbezdin for the Melbourne Bezdin. Um, and he is of the rabbinical administrator, the Poisik, the Rafa Machshir, for Kosher Australia, a position that he has held since 1997. Prior to that, Rabbi Gudnik was involved in Kashrus in Sydney, the Kashrus wing of the Sydney Bezdin Rabbi Gudnik was involved with. And um, so we're talking about decades and decades of experience in Rabbanus and in Kashrus, and it's a big success to welcome Rabbi Gudnik to our webinar series. Nice to be here. Um, so this is our pre-Pesach edition, as we said before. And there's so many questions that the office has been getting over the past weeks, maybe even months, um, regarding Pesach, uh, Pesach issues. So we've uh, chosen and we've received a number of questions that we will address uh, at this webinar. So the first question uh, is very relevant to many people. People tend to go crazy over Pesach cleaning. Um, getting the house ready for Pesach, it can be a big burden to some people sometimes. So I was wondering, Rabbi Gutnik, if you can please share with us the halachic requirements that, are, that, that one has to fulfill when it comes to cleaning the house for Pesach, when it comes to the bedikas, chametz, the search for chametz. Um, I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there, and it would be great if you can hear what the, uh, what the halacha says about that. Well, let me give you an introduction to start with, and I think this introduction doesn't only deal with the concept of cleaning for Pesach, but it deals with in generally keeping Pesach, of how people... Um, in general, in general, uh, tend to go in a sense OCD when it comes to cleaning, when it comes to the foods that they eat and the hechsherim that they accept, and so on. Um, I'd like to introduce the comments with a, a an episode that happened to me many, many years ago when I was a, a young rabbi and I was studying in in a kollel in New York, in the, and um, I used to give a shear every week for ladies who uh, in, a, in a, a group that they got together to learn halachas. When it came to before Pesach, they asked me to speak about Pesach. And I thought to myself that um, just to talk about Pesach in general to a community that it was a Kohl type community and uh, talk to a community that in reality knows most of the basics about Pesach. I didn't want to go over the normal uh, ordinary things and I said to them, give me a few questions and I'll answer them, and I'll see the ones that are common, and I'll answer the common questions. So I got a, a number of questions, and one of the questions intrigued me. The question said, are we allowed to use plastic on Pesach? And um, I thought, I, I haven't heard of the chum, of any humra not to use plastic utensils on Pesach, but I figured from the question that there must be something around. So I went to ask the role of the community, the whole shuna, the whole area. And he said to me, as soon as I asked the question, he said to me, ah, he said, it's, it's a minute, it's a silly minute, it's a silly custom not to use plastic on Pesach. He didn't go into any further details. And when it came to the shear, at the shear, when I said one of the questions I got was whether one is allowed to use plastic utensils on Pesach. And um, I said that I had heard that the reason why people were machmir because of the fact that they thought that plastic was a relatively new material, uh, you know, 100 years ago, whenever it was. People were worried about something that might leach out. Somebody talked about alcohol and, and other things that are in, in, the, in the plastic. So 
a mini gurus, and I said that I can give you on good authority that it's it's not it's not really a minute that you have to keep. Next morning, I attended Kolil as I usually do, and I had a delegation, thank you, from a number of Kolil, other Kolil rabbis who were there. And they turned around to me and they said, uh, Rabbi Gutnik, you allowed our wives, our mothers, to be able to use plastic on Pesach. We have a minute not to use it. How could it be? I said, well, we'll, we'll go and ask the Rav. We went to see the, the rabbi and um, I asked him the question. He looks at me, looks at the fellows behind me who make up this delegation. And I said to him, Rabbi, we're allowed to use plastic on Pesach. And he said, looks at me, looks at them. And he says, no. And I said, excuse me, <laughs> hello, I, I, I uh, asked you the other day and you said it, was, it was, wasn't a valid type of minute. Why are you saying now not to use it? He said, when you asked me, you were asking me from a point of view that obviously there was no minute in place. And you were asking me from a point of view as to what I really thought about the plastic. But when I look at the guys behind you, I see that they really are quite agitated about this answer that you gave them. And I see they obviously had a minute accustomed to not use plastic utensils on Pesach. I'm going to be the last one to take away a custom from um, anybody who holds it for Pesach. Even if I feel it's got no real basis, if that's the custom that people have been using for many years in their family and their homes, I'm not going to take it away from them. And I asked him to elaborate why, and he said to me, well, there's amongst the Hasidic masters in particular, amongst the mystics, there's this concept that says that a person who keeps Pesach very, very carefully um, they'll be protected from doing wrong things the whole year round. They show the, the, the determination, the strength of character to abstain from things that even though they might be permitted, but keep the various customs and so on, they'll be, they'll be saved from doing the wrong thing the whole year round. Some say that the answer was in reality, um, they, would, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't die without doing tshuva, without doing repentance. So it's a very big thing, spiritually it's a very big thing, and so therefore I won't take away a custom from anybody. They want to be careful in, their, in that area, let them go ahead and let them do it, and hopefully it'll help them to abstain from doing other things that learn the concept of, of, of being able to ensure that they are strong in their commitments and, and so on. So I've always taken that on board, right from the very beginning. I, 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 that story happened when I was still a student rabbi. And I've always taken it on board, and I have always been careful about not rubbishing or not putting down anybody's method. But there are things that if people are starting out in particular, or people really in a situation where maybe they can't keep everything that they've heard about, there are things obviously that we need to know the distinction between what is halakhically acceptable, what is halakhically necessary, and what a certain stringency that people have taken upon themselves that if you haven't yet taken it upon yourself, or even if you have, but circumstances have changed, then you can find a, a reason not to be as stringent. And when it comes to cleaning for Pesach, that's, that's a particularly important thing. You know, there are people who will do a total spring cleaning. Pesach's not a time for spring cleaning, although it's in the spring and over, uh, over, overseas, uh, out of Australia, but here in Australia, it's the opposite. It's, we're going, we're, we're heading towards winter already. And so therefore, Pesach cleaning shouldn't be looked at as a time for spring cleaning. It's a time for removing comets from the house. And therefore, you need to do those things that are necessary to remove comets, to remove anything that's leavened at all from the home. It doesn't mean necessarily that you have to get up on a ladder and wash the, the, the kitchen ceiling because uh, we're worried about the fact that maybe steam is from, from comets is sort of somehow or other condensed on the ceiling. You have to make sure that you are removing actual chametz from wherever it may be found. If you have a room where you've never ever brought in chametz, you don't even really have to clean that particular room. If you have a room where maybe the kids brought in chametz, even though you mightn't have, then you do have to clean it out. But when you're cleaning it out and, you, and you're checking for, for the chametz, you have to do it in a, in a rational way. So if there's a hole in the floorboard, for instance, and I'm afraid the comets might have fallen down there, they don't have to pull up the floorboards. It's simply good enough just to make sure that within reach, anything that's in, that's within reach, you can move. If you know that people sat on the couch and ate comets there, say so you move the couch, obviously, and see what's underneath the couch, the cushions of the couch, but you don't have to go overboard. The only the field of checking for comets is in places where you normally 
suspect with, um, with a proper reason that the comets could have been brought there. You clean that, those areas, you make sure that the comets is not there. If there are areas that are inaccessible that may come in contact with something during PESA, for instance, down the drain, there might be something there. And some people pour a, a, a very uh, strong detergent down the drain, caustic detergent down the drain, so that the comets becomes totally nullified um, from, from actually being hollow, uh, comets anymore. It's totally not edible anymore. It's not, it's not something that we have to worry about. So the main thing is to take into account rational, common sense assessment of where you think there may be comets and those areas you need to clean, and those areas you don't have to go overboard, you know, as I said, you don't have to wash the kitchen ceiling, but you clean those areas well and you remove comets. The idea is to make sure comets is not found in your property. Make sure in particular that the comets is not found in such a way where you might inadvertently be used on PESA, but um, other than that, really, you can, you can just turn around and say, look, it's, it's not all that necessary to do it, such as OCD type thorough sprinkling of your house in order to ensure that you can pay such properly. Very informative. I think uh, you know, many people who are unaware of that and who might go a bit too far sometimes and that can affect their simple as Yom Tov also. You go into Yom Tov totally like a shmata, like totally, you know, tired out from all the cleaning. So I think that was a very helpful answer. Thank you. Um, the other big question many people have uh, is kasher. How do we clean our um, utensils? Um, there are four uh, specific items that people ask us to discuss. Uh, how do we kasher them? How do we clean them properly for Pesach? We have the oven. Though I know I think it's a big machlekes between the Eretz Yisrael to place and the Chutz Laaretz place, and whether whether the bechlal can kasher an oven, and if if you can, how do you, how does one go about doing that? Number two is stovetop. The grates on the stovetop. Um, someone asked me recently about the vent. You have to be concerned about comments in the vent on top. Um, that's the oven, the stovetop, sinks. How do we kasher sinks? Some people use what's called an evin malubin. In addition to pouring hot water in the sink, they'll get a they'll heat up a rock or a stone on the stovetop and put that in the sink. Additionally, is that necessary? And uh, a dishwasher also, is that uh, possible to kasher for Pesach? And the countertops, the bench tops. So we have five things, hopefully, we Benjamin discussed. The oven, the stovetop, the sink, the dishwasher, and the countertops. Again. There are many uh, things with regard to Pesach where people adopt certain stringencies that perhaps are not even necessary the whole year round. And for that week, they want to make sure that they are indeed doing things correctly and properly. And as I said, the reasons for that are spiritual reasons because uh, of all the promises of good things happening during the year, especially spiritually, if one keeps Pesach properly. But if we're looking at the strict halacha, let's have a look at an hub. In reality, if we're looking at the strict Basic, basic concepts of halacha. Um, an oven itself, most poskim will agree that the walls of the oven, if they're thoroughly cleaned, and that's important, you have to get rid of all the actual dirt that's in the oven, any residue that's inside the oven as best as you can, in order to ensure that um, when you put something in the oven, it's not going to actually touch or become in contact with real comments. So therefore, the important thing there is to make sure that the oven is clean. Once the oven is clean, some people think that that's good enough. Well, you know, what's wrong? My oven is clean, there's no comments in there, what's the problem? We have the concept, obviously, that things are absorbed into the taste, is absorbed into the walls of the oven. That taste, when it's absorbed, according to halacha, according to the way in which we learn the laws of Kashus and the laws of Pesach, once that taste is absorbed, we have to be worried about the fact that that taste may come out into anything that in which it is comes in contact with while it's hot. So therefore the idea is to clean the oven as best as possible, not only from a cleanliness point of view, but also to clean it from a point of view that halakhically would be acceptable if there's no absorbed taste even inside the oven itself. And the way in which we can do that, the basic halakha would be that if you can get the oven up to a certain temperature, um, basically we say that if it's over 200 degrees Celsius, you turn on the oven and put it on for, for, for a, an hour, an hour and a half, then the temperature gets hot enough that it actually destroys the taste that is inside the walls of the oven. That's only good enough, however, for the things in which don't come in actual contact with, with the Pesach food. So the walls of the oven is one thing, 
Then you've got the actual grates upon which the Pesach pots or the Pesach food is cooked. Technically speaking, if it comes, if those grates come in contact with Pesach utensils, or come, especially if they come in contact with Pesach food that are put in without utensils, they need to be made red hot in order to ensure that um, any taste that's been absorbed will not come out and actually affect something in which it is actually in contact with it. Um, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to get it to red hot. Um, the reason why we get it to red hot is because we know that once it's red hot, it definitely reached the temperatures high enough to be considered as kasher. But in recent times, people have said that if you've got an oven with a, um, a self-cleaning cycle, it actually heats up the oven to a very high temperature. Akoskin, who will rule that that is, don't have to do anything further with the grates, and definitely don't have to do anything further with, with the wall, just by putting it on um, on the on the self-cleaning cycle. But if you don't have a self-cleaning cycle, then what you, the best thing to do is to take it, those oven those grates, thoroughly clean them, put them in the oven when you're cushioning the walls of the oven so that it gets heated up, and then afterwards you will need to cover the grates with something that will make a barrier between anything Pesach that you're putting onto them and the actual grate itself. And that way one can get away with it. If one can actually buy new grates for Pesach, that's even better. But again, then you're starting to get into the more detailed and more stringent way of, of custering and, and looking after it. But the basic thing is oven clean, turn on the oven to uh, over, over 200 degrees. Some people say up to about 250 degrees but as hot as you, uh, as, as, as you can, and then keep it burning for about an hour. Cover the grates afterwards. Be careful when you cover the grates if you cover them in such a way that the heat, the heat can still circulate in the oven. So maybe put a few little holes, or, or don't let it go right up to the sides, tuck it around the grates so that you've got still some uh, areas uh, around the sides where the heat can actually circulate through. And that is technically good enough as far as kashrin and is concerned. Okay, just asking one question on that. If a person normally does not put hummus directly on the grate or paste up the food on the grate, they'll always have it in a pan, but things spill over. They still have to cover yes, it? Yes, they still have to cover it because we say that once there's a liquid between the pan, the pan that they put it on and the grate, that transfers the that transfers the, the taste into the into the racks, and those racks um, become uh, bonus. Okay, so that's with regard to ovens. Stove tops, the ideal way of doing stove tops is again, with regard to kashring for Pesach, things have to be spotlessly clean. In the first instance, you clean it as best as you can to remove any of the residue. If you can't remove the residue, then you really can't use those tops unless you, again, make the uh, parts of the stove, at least those parts of the stove that are around where the flame is, that you make it um, red hot. It's difficult to do that. Some of those, some of the stoves, the hobs on the stoves are, are, are made out of type of metal. It's very hard to get the red hot. So the ideal thing to do then is once you've cleaned the uh, stove, is to buy a blech and to use that blech to cook on. Once there's a barrier, that blech is the, the piece of metal, usually aluminum or stainless steel or whatever it may be. Once that piece of metal is over the top of the stove, it creates a barrier that's good enough between the stove, which is comet stick, which is used for comets, and the pots that you're going to use um, that are, uh, that are basically. Um, that, that's the ideal one. You can even, if necessary, drill a few holes, knock a few holes with a nail and a, and a, and a hammer, knock a few holes in the areas around where the flame are, so that the flame actually cooks the food better and it's not just dissipated under, underneath the black, underneath that, that piece of the metal. And as long as you make sure that where the holes are and not in the areas that where you're exposing actually the metal parts of the holes underneath. So in the areas where underneath this, this uh, free space, do a few holes in, knock a few holes in, and you can use a black. That's the ideal way of doing it. One otherwise, one again wants to be more stringent. People have the custom of actually changing the hobs, having special hobs for Pesach, taking off the tops of the, of the stove and putting them away, and actually using special ones for Pesach. Again, then we're going onto this more stringent version, and you don't have to really uh, cut it at all in those circumstances. What about using aluminum foil to cover the grates? You could use aluminum foil. The only trouble with the aluminum foil is you wrap with aluminum foil around the grates, is that you need to have enough layers of aluminum foil, aluminium as we call it, aluminium foil, that um, 
it's not going to tear and expose the metal parts that are hollow. And so therefore, you know, if, if you're careful, that's fine. If you see that it has become exposed, wrap it around a new, and yeah, that's okay. That, that would be okay. Technically, that's considered all right as far as making the barrier between the problems with the top and the, and the, and the there are other methods that you can do. I'm not going to, I can't go into all of them, but if you get hold of our Pesach guide, you'll see that we have there the different ways in which in which the kasha in more detail actually goes through and tells you each item, how how you can how you can kasha it, what's the best way to kasha it, what's a more lenient way to kasha it, find a lot of detail in there. It should be available on the website, I think, shortly. Okay. Um sink. The sink. Now in reality, a sink is, is usually used with what we call uh, as a cliché, as a second vessel. It's not a vessel that's actually put on the fire and, and, and cooked in. And so therefore, in those circumstances, one can be a little more lenient with regard to cushering the sink than you do with regard to cushering an actual utensil that has been used for cooking the components. And the, halakhically speaking, you can find a reason to say that it's quite simple that you, again, clean the sink properly, clean the sink thoroughly, as I mentioned previously, pour something down the drain in case there's any feces that are stuck down the drain, pour something that's very caustic or, or very strong detergent down the drain so it nullifies the taste of anything that's down there. And then what you can do is boil up a kettle. Um, the kettle should be, can, if, it's, if it hasn't been um, made kosher yet for Pesach or it's not a kosher, a kosher for Pesach kettle, you need to wait 24 hours to make sure that anything has been absorbed in there and it's been sort of dissipated somewhat. Fill up the um, kettle with, with water, boil it up, take the kettle then and pour boiling water all around the sink. Some people use an Evan Maluva, what's called a, a heated stone, in order to raise the temperature up to really, really hot, hotter than anything that could have been in the sink beforehand, because you do take things from the stove and pour it directly into, into the sink, and therefore the comets could have been absorbed that way. You have to get to a heat that's equal to that, or it's higher than that in order to pressure it. And so therefore you take the kettle full of water, boiling water, pour it over the sink. If you want to be very strict about it, not very strict, if you want to be strict about it, then you take a, a number of stones that have been heated up on the fire beforehand or pieces of metal, let's say some big bolts or something like that, that you heat it up on the fire, place it, not with your hand, take it home, and place it on various areas of the sink and then pour the water on. And then those heated stones or heated metal tends to raise the water up to boiling point again. You see the fizz, fizz all over the place, and that is considered as cushering the sink. Now, you can only cusher metal sinks that way. If you have a ceramic sink, you've got a problem. And the only way in which you can really use a ceramic sink on Pesach because it can't be cushered is to actually have an insert to a plastic bowl and cover the, the, the areas that are not, where the plastic bowl is not covered that with uh, aluminum foil, plastic, or something else like that that will make sure that anything you put down is not going to rest directly on the contents of the sink. So they're the basic rules as far as cushioning sinks are concerned. You can also, also use a blow push. I don't advise it for lay people sort of use a blow push unless you're an expert in being able to really um, do blow push properly. Some people have the, concept, uh, the, the idea of actually steaming, using steam for cushioning. They take a steam wand and they will steam it and water, water and steam that comes out of that particular uh, machine, then um, it is good enough as consider, considered, even to the extent of being the same as pouring boiling water on, together with the heated stones. It's, it's a very a, a solid way of crushing. However, I must emphasize that that is only with regard to these types of machines that actually heat the water up to 100 degrees, heat the steam up to 100 degrees, and boiling point, in other words, and then shoots that boiling water when you press the, the, the trigger, it shoots that boiling water over, uh, all, over the, all over the area that needs to be cut. Um, steam that is produced by some other methods, you can see yourself that that steam is not 100 degrees. That steam you can actually put your hand in and it won't go over it. So you need to know that some of these portable steamers that are used for different reasons, or people, somebody once told me that they, uh, they could use the one that they use for pressing clothes as a press that has steam, but you can use that. I doubt it very much. I, I don't have I don't have one, and I haven't really checked with a thermometer. But I doubt it very much whether that steam has really reached the required temperature in in order to cash it when it hits the the the, uh, the sink. Whether it's going to reach the required temperature to cash it, it's 
although steam they say is when water, when water boils at 100 degrees, but there is such a thing as even cold steam. They are the machines that make what they call cold steam, the water sort of forms into droplets. It's not true steam, but one has to be careful to make sure that the steam that's being used, if you're going to use a steamer, has to be a steam that produces heat at 100 degrees. And one of the ways in which you can tell that, to stick with the laundry and see how much the steam is. Okay, so dishwashers? Dishwashers. There are differences of opinion with regard to dishwashers. Um, the only dishwasher that you can really get a, a, a proper a, opinion to say that you can kasher, amongst those who do allow kashering of dishwashers, is a stainless steel interior. If you've got an um, enamel type interior, um, I think there are some dishwashers that may even have a plastic. Plastic, I suppose, you can also kasher according to those who say that the plastic is kasherable. A lot of authorities say that, and you can rely on that if you need to. Um, the dishwasher needs to be, again, thoroughly clean. So you have to take out the baskets, you have to take out especially the filter at the bottom where, where, where actual good stuffs can wash off the plates actually does gather. And you have to clean them all absolutely thoroughly. Once it's actually cleaned thoroughly, then there are two ways in which you can go about it. First way is to take out the trays, cusher the walls again, that don't actually come in contact with the with the pots and pans or the or plates and so on, cusher those walls by turning on the dishwasher. The way of the eight, so the, the advice that's given is to turn on the dishwasher three times at the hottest cycle, and that should be considered sufficient to cusher the, um, the walls of the oven. Others say that you actually need to have, again, like with the sink, you need to have a heated stone. So heat up a, a big stone, or an upper brick, or whatever it may be, stick that inside the dishwasher, and then when the water is uh, circulating there, it gets to a hotter temperature because of the stone than it would normally, and um, some say that you need to do that. But technically speaking, if you wash the walls of the oven at the highest possible temperature that it was used at, and you do that three times, you can get away with cushioning the walls of the oven. The racks of the oven, there is a difference of, what? Dishwasher. Uh, that one talking about, sorry. Oh, exactly. Yeah, the dishwasher. Um, the, the, the racks of the actual dishwasher, um, some say that you shouldn't cash it because of the fact that they're like baskets and they're interwoven and we're afraid of pieces of comments that got involved there. Others say that with regard to the, the racks, you should get, so because of that reason, you should get um, new ones for Pesa. But if, however, you can thoroughly clean, if you honestly feel that you're thoroughly cleaned and you've seen that the, the, the racks are actually thoroughly clean, then put them inside when you're cashing the dishwasher and let the dishwasher cash them that way. There are very that can look there. Again, one wants to be machmer, and one wants to say, look, you know, it's only not the ideal way to cash it, because it really needs boiling water to a to, dollar to really cash it. They will have their own stringencies and won't use dishwashers at all. Like as far as cashing. Countertops are the less. Countertops is very similar to the sinks. What you need to do is because on the countertops you don't have anything that's actually cook, cooking on the countertop itself, therefore it's good enough really to pour boiling water over it. And for mica tops and so on, you can't use the hot stone on them because they're going to uh, melt through if you put the mica tops on. There are some people who claim that anything that's synthetic material is not metal, you can't cash it, so therefore they will say cover, it, cover all the counters. And there are others who say that even if it's metal and you, and you cash it them, cover them, but again, each one goes according to the stringencies. Technically speaking, it's good enough for those who allow cushioning of synthetic materials, many of our bonding do, many of us can do, just to take the water, the, the uh, uh, boiling kettle directly after it's, uh, it's boiled, or even if it's boiling, actually boiling at the time when we can do it as well, it still is plugged in, pour the boiling water all over the counter and that is considered good enough for cushioning. Okay. Um, Okay, the question, um, Rabbi, what leniencies exist for medications, specifically things that relate to blood pressure or other live enhancing, live enhancing drugs? Um, it, it, uh, you, the questions with medication really have to be addressed to or off. Each particular circumstance, each particular person is different. The doctors will tell them different advice and so on. So I don't like to give general rulings with regard to, to it. But, in this case, we're talking about life-threatening situations where you need for blood pressure and other, as you say, uh, life-enhancing drugs. Um, most rabbonim will pass them, but without any question, 
you can take those particular medications. You, you, one is not obliged to put their lives in danger, God forbid, with uh, getting a heart attack or or anything else like that. And therefore, all medications prescribed by a doctor for such, uh, for, for, for such um, um, life-threatening situations that could come to life-threatening, there's a doubt that it may come to life-threatening situations, you can take the medications as whatever you normally take. However, it does say that if you can find a substitute that is, you know for sure is only kidneys, it's not fully comets or definitely comets free, if you can find such a substitute, then obviously one should try to do that as well. And that's why we publish at Kosher Australia, we publish a list of medications that we've investigated to find out whether they are comets, whether they're not comets, whether they're almost comets. And, and in that way, you can, it, 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 together with your doctor and together with the rabbi, you can, um, you can find the proper rule. But one important point has to be mentioned. No one should take it upon themselves. If they're using these types of drugs that are for serious illnesses, maybe not even life-threatening at, at the time, but they're serious illnesses, I, I actually say that anything that the doctor prescribes already is considered serious enough that you cannot change and cannot say, I'm not going to take it, without discussing with your doctor first. You must get the permission of your doctor. Together with your rabbi, you might find a substitute that's good enough. The doctor will say it's good enough. It's not common stick. You might find out that your, your drug that you're taking is indeed not common stick in the first place. So you must discuss it with your doctor. You must discuss it with your own before making any decisions to stop taking prescribed medication. When it comes to vitamins, you want to go off for, uh, for a week, take that off for a week, that's, 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 that's fine. But prescribed medications, you must discuss with the doctor before you decide. I'm worried about the comments and therefore I'm not going to take it anymore. Thank you, David Fisher, for that question, a very relevant and important uh, question to be discussed. Let's turn our attention for a few moments now to the industrial side of things. There is a hotly debated issue here in Australia as of late with regard to levels of supervision for kosher le Pesach runs. Um, there is a concept of batched supervision where there's actually mashkiach tmidi during the production to make sure there's no contamination of, uh, that, would, that would compromise the, the Pesach, kosher Pesach status. Uh, there's also an arrangement where we know that there are no um, ingredients that can pose any threats to the status of the kosher Pesach status. Do we need to have mashkiach tmidi there? Or is there enough that we know that we have systems in place that can guarantee for us that, that everything will be kosher le Pesach? When we're talking about Pesach products, Pesach products, we're talking about something that we need to use for, uh, for just a week, for eight days. And so therefore, certain stringencies that maybe we don't have the whole year round, various uh, agencies, cashless agencies and so on, do accept those stringencies because they say, if you can, if you can do something well and proper and acceptable to put into all authorities rather than just a minority or a few authorities, always we try to do that. Coach Australia has a, a, a policy whereby we, what we do is there are actually three levels. There is a level that is uh, items that are intrinsically kosher. They're made in factories or they're made in places where they have absolutely no problem with regard to ingredients being kosher for PESA. No problem with shared equipment that may have been used for non-PESA sticker items beforehand. In those circumstances, we say that you can really use those products without any supervision whatsoever. We don't necessarily certify them, but we do put them down as approved for Pesach use. And the reason for that, some of them are made even certified in certain circumstances. And the reason for that is because there is no possibility at all in the way they're manufactured, there's no possibility of them being um, uh, in any way contaminated by hummus, either through ingredients or through actual um, machinery or through ingredients that may be in the rest of the factory that may waft across or somehow other go through. Now in old in the old times um, when, when a factory was making certain things it was quite possible that there could be cross contamination. I don't know whether many of you or how many of you have gone into factories today and I know that when we go in they dress us up like, a, like we are going to Mars. We have hair nets, we have beard nets, we have white clothing, we have special shoes sometimes, we have goggles. They, 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 uh, one place I went to, the only place that was out in the open with my eyes, and even then I had to wear a pair of goggles. And the reason for that is because people are very, very con concerned these days about cross-contamination, especially when it comes to things that could uh, be cross-contamination with allergies, for example, where 
where they can be sued if they find that there's, there's, been, there's been some form of cross-contamination. So in many factories today, it, it's very, very rare to even think that um, you would have cross-contamination. No worker is going to drop his lunch into, uh, into, uh, into a, a, a particular company, well-known companies are making products. They're not going to eat their lunch in the same area that we have to worry like we did in the old days, that maybe some comets could inadvertently get in that way. But nevertheless, we uh, reserve our non-supervised production to those places that are either totally comets free and only produce kosher for pizza products, or we find that there are certain lines or areas of factories where they are totally dedicated for comets products and there's no, there's no possibility of cross-contamination. We will allow and we will certify those products um, even if there's no much gear present. Somebody obviously has to go in in the first instance to check out the whole system, and that's what we, that's what we do, to make sure that everything is indeed a separate, a separate production. But where you get a, a situation whereby machinery is used for um, comets, and that machinery is now going to produce a product, uh, a, a product that's innocuous and could be used for beta, we will not produce that product without a supervisor present. He has to check the cushioning of the, of, the, of the equipment. We have to make sure that there's no cross-contamination of if, for instance, a company has a certain uh, ingredient that is kosher lapesa and the same ingredient is not kosher lapesa. He has to check that they only use the kosher lapesa ingredient. So therefore, in those circumstances, we will insist upon a mashkiah being present and special batch production being made. But there are more and more things that we're identifying lately, and we're trying to do this in order to help the consumer, that more and more things that are being produced lately in, in Factories that are dedicated, that are totally comets free, and can be considered as certified for PESA, even though there's no mashkiach present at the time. So we have very defined areas where we can insist on a mashkiach, where we don't have a mashkiach, we have some things that are even allowed, even though, um, for instance, we haven't even gone into the factory, but we know that these things like salt and, and so on, that are accepted around the world as being what we call a group one product, even for PESA, and we don't have to, to worry about it. Okay. We're running a little late. Do you have time for a few more questions? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, a few more very relevant questions we've received. Um, what is the Kosher Australia official position on quinoa? Is quinoa considered kidneys for those Ashkenazi Jews? Let me explain to you a little bit what, what kidneys is. People think that kidneys is, is confined only to a particular type of, of uh, um, legume or I don't know the exact botanic name for them, but certain things. The, the kidneys was introduced as a, as a decree by the sages quite some time ago in Ashkenazi communities. It was never accepted within Sephardi communities, and that's why you'll find Sephardi do allow kidneys. Kidneys is, is, is things like rice, lentils, beans, peas. And the reason why they were chosen as being um, a release rabbinically prohibited on Pesach was for, for, for a number of reasons. One reason is because they were very similar to grain. They were used in the, in the, in the same way. Rice, for instance, was used very much you know, just like you'd use an ordinary grain, which is true, which can become true comets. Um, other uh, reasons for kidneys, the, uh, the decree about kidneys was because of the fact that they were produced always in such a fashion where they could become contaminated by by uh, um, by comets. For instance, they grow in the same field as wheat or, or barley or other such things that, are, that can become real comets. They grow in the same field and when they are then harvested, some of the barley from last year's crop or from the previous crop or some of the wheat might be harvested along together with them. And in those circumstances, therefore, the rabbi said, avoid them. So we have various things that have been identified. The question is now, what do we do about grains and other such things that were not actually uh, in the, around in the time when these, when this particular decree was being enacted? Um, do we just automatically say that everything else is considered okay because it's never part of the decree? Or do we say, no, if the reasons for the original decree on kidneys can be found with those grains as well, then that can be a problem. So quinoa is it similar to the five grains of, that are, can become comets or, or, or isn't it? So quinoa, they, they, they were, they were, at first when it was first brought out, people were very wary about it because it was used in, in Central America, South American countries, the same way as we would use grain. 
And the same reason, therefore, is why we say rice is a problem, even though it's not one of the technical, technically one of the five grains that can become comets. The rabbis obeyed rice because it was very similar to it. People thought maybe quinoa was the same. Over the years, since it's become more and more popular, more and more rabbis have tended to be lenient and have tended to say, no, it's not the same as a grain. It's not used as, it's never ground into flour and, and used like, like, like grain flour is. It's not, it's, it's not considered as one of those uh, um, categories of, of vegetables or, or, or grain or whatever you want to call it that was actually in the decree in the first instance. The only thing that remains is that how, um, how probable or possible is it that it can be contaminated with real farmers? And we have found that quinoa was grown in fields which were used previously for wheat and barley, and they the same ideas can apply to quinoa as it can for ordinary farmers, for ordinary kidneys. Uh, um, so over the, over the years, more and more uh, rabbis have started to say that it's okay as long as we check that final form to make sure that there's no contamination from any comets from any um, comets grain. And the way in which they do that is to make sure it's not just in the fields, but even in the factories. If you get it processed through the same and, and, and packaged with the same equipment that they just processed or packaged things that are comets, that can also be a problem with how much contamination there can be as well. So some organizations, some cautious organizations have actually traced the quinoa from the fields through the packaging factory and then put a kosher case up mark on it. Um, most authorities will therefore say, if you get a responsible organization that's put a kosher for face outside on it, you can use it. You don't have to worry that it's hidden. There are still some people who still worry, maybe it's considered hidden, but again, that's a kuma for face up that some people have taken upon themselves. You have on whom to rely if you want to use kinwa as long as you know that it's been processed for face up. In other words, you can't just go into the shop and buy ordinary kinwa, even if it's got a kosher symbol for the whole year round. You really need to know that it's been processed in such a way that we haven't got contamination from, from any comets, because that's another category as what's called kidneys, and therefore in those circumstances, you need to look for the pressure of the outside. And it's around. They are around the OU. I know it produces quite a number of uh, different products, kinial products that actually has the OUP on it, but they put it in the kosher the place. Very good. Uh, very informative, thank you. And um, if you refer to our kosher, our kosher Australian Pesach guide, I think we have a list of the of common kidneys uh, products, so you should definitely take a look there to make sure to stay away from it, those Ashkenazi Jews. Okay, another question, another custom actually discussed customs before that people have is they purchase all their food before Pesach, in particular milk. Um, is there an issue in purchasing kosher Pesach food on Pesach, um, milk products or milk, or should everything be purchased before? Okay, so milk is one of these products that we consider it as being um, acceptable from the point of view that if there's nothing in it that could be, that could, under normal circumstances, could be considered as being um, um, not kosher for pesa. It's pure milk from a cow, milk is considered all right. There are those who keep what we call follow Israel that will only a whole year round drink milk that has been checked by a Jewish person who has been there at the time of the milking and checks to make sure there's no cross contamination with other milks and so on, then obviously the, that follow this role will be considered kosher with Pesach. And um, people, there are people who, especially on Pesach, do, do head towards buying that particular type of milk. But ordinary milk, for those who drink ordinary milk the whole year round, in reality, the only question that we have is, uh, perhaps on Pesach itself, because milk is milk in, in farms where the cows are eating by the eating plummets, and actually while they're being milked, you, you'll notice whoever the things are milking the cows, you'll see they have the crops full of, full of grain and other things that the cows are eating, so it keeps them calm while they're being milked. And it's possible that there could be a, a possibility of some of that food stock falling into the, into the milk. And, uh, on a whole year round, maybe, you know, you don't have to worry, it's, it's filtered out, there are very strict sanitary conditions in these farms and so on. But on Pesach, where it's also the mashable, where the smallest amount of vomits can be a problem, on Pesach itself, it's not nullified, and therefore, people therefore say, all right, I'll buy the milk before Pesach, if there has been a problem, something's fallen in, it's totally before Pesach, it's been totally nullified, there's no question that that milk would be therefore contaminated with vomits, therefore they buy the these things, these kind of before before Pesach. So if there is any 
chance that Thomas falling in is nullified anyway. Usually it doesn't happen, but if there is a chance, then it is nullified. But on pace of itself, people are more, are more careful. Um, I believe in Israel, they make sure that the cows are not fed from it, and therefore the milk is, is milked in Israel during the Kolomoy, uh, uh, not on the face of the itself, but during the weekdays of, of, of uh, between the first days of the and the, the last days of the Antwerp. People use, use that milk, they have no problem with regard to, you know, to, to using it because there's no comments around. So again, various on various customs and various stringencies that people take upon themselves, but if you do take something that's not supervised, you don't have a supervisor present, and there was a possibility that it could be a mixture of comments as I mentioned previously. In those circumstances, you buy before Pesach, and you say that anything that may have been there has been nullified before Pesach. Very interesting. One final question. Uh, I know you mentioned before that story about cl using plastic uh, plates and cutlery. What about using paper Paper plates and, and um, some powdered gloves, things like that. Should people be staying away from that, or is that acceptable? Look, there, there are authorities that allow um, paper, paper products. What, what the problem with paper products are, that in order to stiffen the, the, the paper, in order to make sure that it you know, just doesn't look like all the, all the paper and collapses, in order to stiffen the paper, they put starch in. And that starch can sometimes be from wood pulp and therefore uh, with the starch, but it's wood pulp and manufactured in such a way that it comes out like cardboard with it and very, very thick. Most of the time, however, they take ordinary paper pulp and they mix starch into it. The starch has the property of actually stiffening the paper and making it, making it strong. The question is whether that starch can leach out on paper. So there are some who say you don't have to worry about that starch at all. Totally by the time it's in the, in the uh, in the paper plates, it is totally not, not, not food stuff anymore. It's totally lost its category of being food stuff, and so therefore it is considered all right. Others will say no, even in even in those circumstances, we put something hot in it, some taste of the starch can bleach out, some of it, and, and, and it could be a problem. So therefore, they confine paper goods to only things which are cold. And there are others who who uh, who say no. It's got starch in it. We, we, we just don't want to take any chance with it. And therefore, under those circumstances, we'll model our paper plates. Um, we have to be careful um, as to what sort of starch is there, whether there is a possibility of leaching out. And the various authorities rule accordingly. Now, because in America, for instance, they may rule that paper plates are considered okay, doesn't necessarily mean that that's the, the situation in Australia. In America, the reason why they say that even if it leaches out, even if the starch does leach out into the food, it's only um, cornstarch. Cornstarch is not from its gumball. It's like it's, as we mentioned previously, it is kidneys. It is, it is one of those things, corn is one of those things that were banned because it appears to look like the grain. And in Ashkenazi communities, we totally accepted that ban, as I mentioned previously. So cornstarch, however, once it's made into such a into such a way that it's used for the pack of the plates and lost its total taste and lost its total entity as being really a, a, a food product, there are those who say there's no problem, no will allow, and therefore that's why they allow certain certain authorities overseas to allow paper plates to be used in, in under all circumstances. In Australia, it's not necessarily this case. We have situations that we find that certain general rulings have been given overseas, which don't apply for Australia, and the opposite. Sometimes we can give certain general rules that might not necessarily apply overseas. And let me give you an example. Um, there are a number, quite a number of authorities, even very, very strict authorities, that allow the use of um, apple, uh, so apples, fruits, whatever it may be, that are actually canned, using an apple, the peaches, the pineapple, pineapple, things like that that are not canned. And they say that even though those products are actually cooked in the factory and so on, they believe, they say that the factories overseas are such that they are not cooked with anything that could be a problem, not using the same machinery that anything can be a problem, and therefore will allow, allow generically, will allow, allow all canned foods. In Australia, we have found that the major manufacturer of canned fruits in Australia manufactures these canned fruits in the Fruit season, in the season when the apple is growing, or the pineapples are growing, when the, when the um, uh, peaches are growing, plums are growing, and so on, they'll manufacture them. During the off months, when the fruits are not available to be canned, they don't want to sit let the factory remain idle. You know? They want to get some extra money from using their machinery the whole year round, not just at certain times of the year. 
So in order to rationalize the use of those equipment, they will can other things during the off season. We have had the major factory here actually can, canning um, uh, spaghetti with cheese. At one stage they were canning chicken soup. And the machinery, therefore, the same machinery that's used later on to manufacture the and to cook up the canned fruits were used in the off season for really trade the club. And what we had to do is at the end of the in, in the, at the end of the, the off season, when they're going to start canning, we have to send much different in and we will usher out all of their equipment in order to make sure that the fruit being produced was okay. Now, in America, they don't seem, or in England, they don't seem to worry about the use of the, uh, the equipment um, in off season. Maybe they don't, they, but they know that they don't use the equipment in off season or they're producing fruit the whole year round. But in Australia, we found it's a problem. So, therefore, generically to say, that all canned fruits don't are intrinsically okay and don't have a problem, we have a difficulty with that here in Australia. And the same thing applies with other other things as well. For instance, the starch that's used in the um, for manufacture of paper plates in Australia could very well be wheat is very common in Australia, just as much as corn is common in the United States. And wheat is chametz gamur; it's it's actual chametz. And if they're using a, a wheat starch, even those authorities that permit overseas will say, no, comet starch, we would, we would not allow, we would not permit. And so therefore, without knowing how these products are actually produced, we therefore have a problem with giving a generic ruling on paper plates. And that's why in our list, we will actually only list those particular products that we'll check, and we know that they are free of, of comets, we will uh, recommend them, and we will list them. But to make a general ruling, we won't. In those circumstances. So just because you hear something's kosher overseas, uh, generically, doesn't necessarily mean that that's the situation here in Australia or in other countries. What's okay in America might be okay in Europe. What's okay in America and Europe might be okay in Australia. What's okay in Australia might be okay in America and Europe. So you have to get the authorities, local authorities, to be able to give you a, a proper and, and true reading and, and uh, result of their investigation. And I think that's a point that can't be overemphasized. The differences between the different places, I think a significant amount of confusion that the, we get from consumers is with this issue, that there's a certain product, it's the same exact product, it's available in Australia, available in the United States. Why is, the, why is, it, why is it okay here, not okay there? Why is it not okay here and okay there? We are, everyone has to realize that um, different places uh, come from different factories and every country is unique. And therefore, like the rabbi said, we have to always ask the local, um, cautious authority uh, about what to how to act in such cases. Okay, that brings us to the end of this uh, session. I'd like to thank Rabbi Gutnik for that very informative, interesting uh, the answers to the questions. Um, taking time out of your busy schedule, we really appreciate that. I'd like to wish everyone a kosher in Pesach and a freilich in Pesach, a chag kosher v'semeach. Thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you next time on the Kosher Australia webinar series. Kosher and freilich in Pesach.